going. Afternoon to everybody. Welcome on board. We're going to deal with loads on vehicles in this session. Please, please put yourself on mute, everybody. Okay, mute everybody, please. All right, thank you. Continuing on, we're going to deal with loads on vehicles in this session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, once again, we've got a very broad spectrum, huge interest uh, in the session. So thank you for that. Uh, we're going to jump straight into it. Matter of procedure, as always, acknowledgement notice of housekeeping, the Poppy Act and everything is being complied with in terms of everything that is referenced and used here in. Uh, the session is being recorded, so if you don't want yourself heard or seen, if you want it by police file, please keep yourself off. Uh, cameras off, please keep yourself muted. Please feel free to ask questions via the questions panel or raise your hand. Or, uh, we generally deal with that when we get later on into the session. Just give me one second. OK, continuing on, unfortunately, our guest speaker has not been able to make it today, but uh, it doesn't change anything of the format or the content. We will continue on. Uh, we'll deal with that as we get to that section. First of all, special thank you again, as always, to our Vico. As I have always acknowledged, uh, our Vico has come on board with us to allow us to present these sessions free to everybody. So please support those that support you. Our Vico has been very kind to us to assist us with these sessions. Thank you to our Vico. Um, these are bi-monthly sessions, so every second month we have a session on. If you haven't attended these before, just check our website, or if you are on the mailing list, it will come out to you. Mr. Martin Ordell is meant to have been online with us to discuss the subject matter, but unfortunately has not been able to make it at last moment. So we are going to be dealing with the subject matter of loads on vehicles, uh, and I highlight that it's an expansive and, and complex subject. Uh, it's simply impossible to cover all of the factors. So what we intend on doing is bringing everything that needs to be brought to your attention uh, immediately. Obviously, the onus lies on you yourself as a practitioner at whatever level to go and make sure you brush up on all the finer details. So the reason for load parameters uh, or loads on vehicles, and in particular, uh, everything we're going to deal with here is broad spectrum to all vehicles, but primarily commercial industry. So there's various key factors that relate to loads on vehicles, and these are primarily vehicles, roads, bridges, and buildings have weight limits. Very clearly, we know this. Uh, we see this daily on our roads with roads being damaged by both volume as well as weights of vehicles. But in particular, we're talking about the fact that if you overload vehicles, uh, there's an issue with that. So this is one of the reasons why we have limits with loading vehicles. Roads, bridges and buildings have maximum widths and maximum heights. We know this and we see this because, as we will explain, vehicles can only be loaded to a certain height. And this pertains particularly to bridges uh, and overhead objects and obviously widths. Once again, bridges and objects alongside. One of the reasons for this is the reasons why the civil engineers design within certain parameters. And so this relates to the loads that we have on our vehicles. Vehicle stability uh, is a huge factor with loads. So things like your static stability rollover factor, uh, which to put it in real simple layman's, layman's terms is how stable is your vehicle while you're traveling? Uh, and so the effect of the load, the distribution of the load, the weight of the load affects the vehicle. And arguably, the biggest factor is the risk of death and injury. So all of these factors, your width, your height, your weight, uh, the risk of death and injury is, is the biggest factor of all of these. So as an example for you, as you can see, these are typical things we see. Um, these may not all necessarily be relative to one thing, not just overloading or not just width. It can be a combination of factors. Um, 
So, for example, on the bottom right, we see there a restricted height signboard, very typical of what we see in South Africa and relates directly to the issue of loads on vehicles. Containers, uh, we see a vast amount around of this around South Africa. So both the issue of securing, positioning, loading in terms of mass, in terms of generally width and height is generally not a problem with containers, but it's more the, the mass and the securing. Transport of wood uh, and likewise sugarcane, we see a lot of that around South Africa. Um, the securing of that, the appropriate loading, both in terms of its weight uh, and other factors. Palletized stuff um, on, on pallets in terms of securing the load on the pallet itself and likewise uh, the load within a container or on a vehicle is an issue as well. Uh, a lot of other commodities such as steel wire, steel rope, steel rolls, those kinds of things, uh, there's very specific requirements as well for that. So these are just some examples. I'm sure most of you would directly or indirectly deal with this in terms of either your clients, yourselves, uh, who you insure, cases you have to look at that relate to these issues. Just some more examples. We can see that even though that's a container on the bottom left, the securing of the load within the container being a very clear factor. Uh, top and bottom, alternative loads on vehicles, very often an issue in terms of how securely they are loaded onto the vehicle, and we will come to that. So let's start off first of all with the legalities. Uh, what does the National Road Traffic Act, and we all know by now, the National Road Traffic Act is our go-to for everything that deals with the roads and the vehicles. So the National Road Traffic Act itself provides very little specific guidance or commentary. Um, there are, in essence, nine key sections, or what we refer to as regulations, that you need to be aware of. There are others that are applicable, but these nine key sections are what you should read. You could literally get them read in 15 minutes and have a very good understanding. So my strong suggestion to you, although we're going to brief through them here, I'll bring them to your attention. Once you receive the recording or if you're making your own notes, just go and find these particular regulations if you deal with loads and read these. So let's look at them. So the first one is regulation, National Road Traffic Act Regulation 49, and it has section 1A through G. We're not going to go through every single part of this. I'm simply going to highlight for you the key factors that relate in specific to issues of uh, loads on vehicles. And we see at C, it says, exercise proper control over the driver of such motor vehicle to ensure the compliance by such driver with all the relevant provisions of this act, in particular the provisions regarding. Now, I highlight that because it's a very broad term. And as you can see, as we go further forward, the driver has massive responsibility. He is the custodian of the load. He's the one that has to oversee that it is loaded properly, or maybe not necessarily him himself, but he is the key person. He also has to check that it is secure properly, etc. So there is, an, there is a requirement in law that you or the person in charge of the company or the vehicle ensures that the driver knows what he's doing. And that falls to Regulation 49, Section C. At 40, uh, Regulation 49, Section C2, it says, specifically, it says, the loading of such vehicle as prescribed under this Act. So there it is. It goes further to say, not only generally, but specifically, it is the driver's duty and responsibility to make sure that he at least has the basic knowledge of how to, how to ensure that everything is loaded on the vehicle correctly. Uh, G, take all reasonable measures to ensure that such motor vehicle is operated on a public road in compliance with the provisions for the loading and transportation of goods as prescribed by or under this Act. So there it specifically says under Regulation 49, it raises not only generic, it raises specifically the issue of loading. And that is because loading, uh, in terms of all the factors we've already highlighted, mass, height, width, and that relating to safety is a major, major issue. So Regulation 49, you need to be acutely aware of that. 
We're going to brief over regulations 240, regulation 241, 242, and 243. Uh, these specifically deal with the issues of mass load carrying capacity of the road, mass load carrying capacity of bridges, distribution of mass uh, and wheel mass loads on vehicles, and axle mass load of vehicle fitted with tires other than pneumatic tires. In simple terms, the Act prescribes that there are certain limits, certain parameters to load. We're not going to go through all of these here, but you need to know and read all of these. These are fairly technical issues. So if you are not inclined to understand the technical issues of how a vehicle is configured in terms of what it can carry uh, as a maximum by the number of tires or axles that it has, uh, or the type of load, etc. You need to specifically read through these and then consult with somebody uh, that would be able to assist you to understand that. But to put it in simple terms, these sections or regulations deal with the permissible specification of loads and appropriate distribution of loads on vehicles in relation to the tires, axles, structures, or any other factors. Be aware and call on specialists should there be a, a query in this regard. So just keep this in mind if you are dealing with specifically, I say again, the loads on the vehicles in terms of how they are to be loaded, where their maximum weight, what the vehicle itself can carry, uh, then that falls under these sections. Right, the manner in which goods are carried falls under regulation 246. So you can note that for yourself and uh, this particular section, the manner, regulation 246 is much of what we're going to cover here. And again, I've highlighted the specific issues for you, 246B, uh, manner in which goods to be carried in such a manner as to obscure the driver's view of traffic to the front or either side. In other words, you should logically dictate no person shall operate on the road a vehicle carrying any goods in such a manner. So in other words, you cannot do this. You cannot obs obscure the view front, rearwards, or to the side, uh, or the effect of the, the mirrors. Um, I know immediately this question says, well, the rear view mirror is obscured. Uh, that's not so because you have the alternatives of your internals as well as your externals. What they are saying uh, to understand that from a legal perspective is that you cannot have no view to the rear. You must have some view to the rear, left side, right side, and or center, which are not safely contained within the body of such vehicle or securely fastened to such vehicle and which are not are not properly protected from being dislodged or spill, spilled from such vehicle. So the fact that they say spilled, that is a solid load or a liquid load and selfly contained within. So in essence, to put that in simple layman's terms, there it clearly says in the Act 246, you cannot have something that is loose, going to fall off, it's not secure, it's going to slide around, is a danger. So it clearly sets it out for you in the Act. E, it says, in any container which has provisions for fastening by means of twist locks, unless such container is securely fastened by at least four twist locks. This is crucial because I think a lot of you, uh, as do we, deal with containerized transport, uh, which seems to be a huge portion of the transport industry. Uh, and we often see uh, containers being transported around literally with two twist locks on alternative corners or same corners, same end corners. Uh, it is against the law. It very clearly says there has to be a minimum of four. Uh, preferably, if there is facility for six or eight, all of them should be engaged for obvious reasons of safety, but minimum of four. Projections in case of vehicles uh, other than motor vehicle, motor, motor tricycle or pedal cycles, in other words, everything else besides a bicycle and a motorcycle. This is regulation 227. It says, in the case of a bus uh, or a goods vehicle uh, uh, contemplated, 1,3 meters. So in other words, the center line of the vehicle, if you draw a center line down the vehicle from the front to the back, 1,3 meters to either side, which therefore gives you your 
National Road Traffic Act Regulation 223, which is the maximum permissible width of a vehicle, which is 2.6 meters. So 1.3 from the center line, 1.3 to the left and 1.3 to the right gives you that 2.6 meters. Uh, interestingly, this relates to the issue of the lane widths. So the civil engineers generally will construct the lanes to about uh, 3, 3.2, 3.4, and sometimes if they're lucky, if there's enough space on the road, even 3.8 or 3.9 meters wide. What that then allows is the 2.6 width of the vehicle can then fit in the lane very uh, spaciously, if you want to put it that way. All right, it says uh, more than 300 millimeters beyond the front end and 1.8 meters beyond the rear end of the vehicle. So in other words, if, for instance, you are driving around in your little sedan and you have something loaded and strapped on the roof, it cannot project further than 300, meters, 300 millimeters over the front of the vehicle and it cannot protrude further than 1.8 meters beyond the rear of the vehicle. So these factors you need to be aware of, 227. Warning in respect of projections of loads. This is regulation 229. No person shall operate a vehicle on a public road if the load on such vehicle projects more than 150 millimeters beyond the side thereof. During periods between sunset and sunrise or at any other time when Due to insufficient light or unfavorable weather conditions, persons and vehicles upon the public road would not be clearly visible at a distance of 150 meters. So again, they are saying, if you are going to be carrying something which is right at that limit and or protruding, uh, then there needs it needs to be visible, needs to be very clearly visible. Interestingly with this, Regulation 158 of the National Road Traffic Act deals with your headlights and your tail lights or any lights on your vehicle. That regulation specifies that at least at 150 meters, they must be visible. So they have used that same 150 meters here to say, if anything is protruding, then it must be visible at least 250 meters. Right, during any other period, the extent of such projection is indicated by means of flags or red cloth, not less than 300 millimeters by 300 millimeters, suspended by two adjacent corners thereof, transversely to the direction in which the vehicle is traveling from the front uh, and rear of such projection. So in simple layman's terms, as most of us would know, if there is uh, a load that is protruding, and if it is right at that limit or further, you are supposed to have a flag or some suitable system that it is visible by 150 meters. And so there it is written in the act for you. Once again, you need to read these uh, and you need to be aware of them. And if for some reason you are not aware, become aware or then get hold of us or a suitable console, uh, um, uh, consultant that can guide you on these things. Right, overall height. This is perhaps, uh, height is perhaps um, arguably the most dangerous and, and arguably the most common thing that we see um, not being applied to. Uh, I say the most dangerous, not simply because if you look at that picture that you are seeing, you can see it says 3.6 meters. That is the exact bridge, and that is the actual side of the bridge that was struck by the gas truck up in Gauteng that exploded. So that's what that bridge originally looked like. There you can see that bridge is signboarded, albeit an old signboard, at 3.6 meters. You will read in this regulation, it says, in the case of a double-decker bus exceeding 4.5, 4,65 meters. In other words, 4.65 meters is what all of the bridges are at. Uh, sorry, what your your maximum height is at. In, in other words, this allows that the civil engineers will always build the bridges that that would be allowed to be cleared. Normally, you would have about 200 or 300 uh, further clearance from that, but we can see here this bridge being at 3.6 is exceptionally low. So in other words, the 4,65 uh, 
of the heart of a vehicle would never fit underneath there. It would never clear. So again, the overall height of a vehicle is restricted at 4.65 meters. And there it is in the regulations. So you need to be aware of that. Interestingly, we've done quite a few cases where there has been this um, height variance and it has caused a problem. Um, and what is of note is that in all of the cases that we've dealt with, the drivers have never had facility to actually measure. When we say actually measure, so to say in the old school, you would have a yardstick that you would literally stretch up and it would reach to 4.65 meters or uh, a, a measuring stick. And when we've asked the drivers in those cases, they've said, no, they don't have that facility. They estimate it. Uh, so if you are dealing with loads that are at a particular height, one of the things you should have is a proper measuring stick that the driver or whoever the loaders are know where that limit is. Legalities of loads, uh, other legalities beyond that of what is directly written in the National Road Traffic Act, TRH 11, dimensions and mass limitations and other requirements for abnormal load vehicles. So if you deal with abnormal load vehicles, vehicles that are beyond the specification set out in the Act here in terms of what your regular maximum weight your regular height and your regular width is, then it is classified as an abnormal load. Then you need to be aware of the parameters for that and you need to be aware of TR11, TRH11, and you may need to have read through that as well. Not going to go into that uh, in any further detail here, except to say it's, it is available online. It's a PDF document. It's 57 pages long um, and you should have that at your fingertips and should know that very well. Legalities of loads other, um, here we're talking about um, other acts and regulations. So for instance, the Occupation Health and Safety Act that deals with lifting equipment and driven machinery. When loads are being loaded on and off, um, very often it may still be labor intensive in terms of being done by hand. But again, if forklifts, cranes, snatch blocks, those kinds of things are being used, any form of lifting, moving equipment. You need to be aware of the Occupation Health and Safety regulations. You need to be aware in very simple layman's terms that this equipment needs to be uh, accounted for. It needs to be up to standard. It needs to be um, inspected. It needs to be certified. And the users or operators of it also need to be um, appropriately trained, experienced, uh, and know how to use it properly. So please just be aware of that in terms of loads on vehicles. And the the critical sections are sections 8, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, and 18. And th those are the critical sections. All right, we get to the, 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 the somewhat more interesting part, and this is the standards. So in South Africa, we do have standards. These standards are SANS, as you can see, that stands for the South African National Standards. In other words, this is the same as SABS. So you are required by law to comply with this. This is, so to say, the minimum standard guidelines. And I will read verbatim. Typically, the National Road Traffic Act, or NRTA, would refer the reader to the appropriate SABS SANS or other ECE, ARP, etc. guiding standards. Nonetheless, the standards are developed or changed. As such, the NRTA does not always reference these standards. So, uh, most of you working in the transport industry would appreciate that just because the National Road Traffic Act doesn't say X, does not mean it's not applicable. If it doesn't say, or if it does say, for instance, refer to SANS 21, and you get to SANS 21, and for instance, that's changed, uh, it is a requirement that you need to know that that SANS has changed, uh, and it is your responsibility. The law says ignorance is not bliss. If you work in this game in any respect at all, then you need to know these things, you need to be up to speed on them. 
Regardless, there's an inherent requirement for an owner, manager, or specialist, OHS or safety officer, to remain up to date in the field. As such, these key standards are applicable, and these are the ones that I'm going to highlight for you, just very briefly. So there they are, SANS 101871, general requirements. This general requirements is applicable to all the subsequent ones, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So you can see I've put there what the cost is for you. There is a price that's involved in purchasing these. Uh, and I've said to you how many pages there are per document. If you work in the transport industry and you in any way deal with loads, you should have these at your fingertips. In particular, all transporters should have these specific to the loads that they transport. So immediately they would buy general requirements. That's a standard. And if they were dealing with abnormal loads or dangerous goods or glass sheeting, they would either buy seven, eight or nine. So as we can see, it's general requirements, general freight, metal loads, timber and sugarcane, loose bulk loads, containers, abnormal loads, dangerous goods, and glass sheeting. Right, and I know all of you all knew that these existed. So well done to you all. And for those of you that didn't, well, now you do. SANS 1023231, uh, transporting of dangerous goods by roads, operational requirements. It's a fairly sizable document, 171 pages. So if you are dealing with dangerous goods, uh, you should also be dealing with that in terms of the loads on your vehicles. Um, these are not the only ones. Please understand that in terms of loads on your vehicles, especially if you're dealing with things like dangerous goods, there are other standards that relate to loads on your vehicle in terms of the vessel itself, the piping, the pressures, uh, unloading and loading procedures, etc. All right, ARP 0673-2008, South African Standards, Recommended Practice consign, uh, Consignee Requirements Goods. It's another document that is available. Uh, you should be aware of this. Uh, it has certain applications in particular areas and avenues. It is freely available, 32 pages PDF online, so that can be downloaded. So please be aware these are the standards that the Act will direct you to. The Act will give you basic minimum requirements. It will then say, please go and read or please be aware of. So in terms of the general requirements, the one where I've highlighted that it says all, I'm not going to go through all of the details of that. However, that particular one uh, gives you certain parameters that are then applicable to all of the subsequent loading specifications. Uh, uh, it is key that the general requirements is carefully considered, especially the normative references. For those of you that have never heard that before, normative references in layman terms simply says there are lots of standards or lots of listed um, documents that you need to go and read if you are using, for instance, short chains for lifting purposes. If you are using those short link chains, you need to go and re read EN 818. If you're using short link steel chains, you need to go read SANS 189. If you are dealing with clamps for wire ropes, there it is, SANS 813. Perhaps the most common ones that we deal with is the straps, the wire ropes, uh, the forged shackles, uh, and the straps. Um, so SANS 52195, load restraint assemblies on vehicles, safety part two, web lashing made from man-made fibers. So very often your nylon straps, that's SANS 52195, um, is very often something that is referred to if those straps are not up to standard. Please be very, very aware and very cautious that, as I highlighted on this page, ECE ARP, some of the SANS standards are not always up to date, and there may not always be a specific SANS standard um, for every single little thing. Very often, the standard that we follow here will be an ECE or ARP or one of the other standards. It may be, for instance, um, 
a European standard, an American or an Australian standard, uh, depending on what the product is. So crates full of beers, uh, that would likely be, that would certainly be under general requirements. It would also be under general freight. Um, so those would be the two key ones, but you would also want to look at loose bulk, loose bulk loads as well. So those three, SANS 18, uh, 10187, uh, 101872, and 101875, that's the question that was posed by Mr. Duby in the questions there. So I would strongly suggest that if that is what you are dealing with, you get those particular standards and read through those. So your general or normative references within the general requirements, which is SANS 101871, the very first one you should read, it is also directing you to all of these requirements as well. So in terms of standards of loads, um, it can get quite complex and detailed, but to put it in very, very simple terms for you, perhaps the most relevant factor, which is referred under the general requirements, which is part one, is section six thereof, and it says strength of securing system, 612, it says magnitude of forces, it says forces involved, all vehicles and all loads, forward deceleration, of 10 meters per second squared, rearward deceleration of five meters per second, sideways or lateral, left to right, five meters per second squared, and vertical 17 meters per second squared. So what does that mean in layman's terms? In very simple layman's terms, it means any load that you have on your vehicle must be able to be held in place when it is loaded and secured to 10 meters per second squared. What does that mean? That means harsh braking. So if your if you if your truck drives down the road and it is fully loaded, let's say as Mr. Dubey asked, with uh, six pallets on one side and six pallets on the other side, and that driver applies very harsh braking, a deceleration rate of 10 meters per second squared, that load should be safely secured on that vehicle. It might shake, it might vibrate, but it should not dislodge and it should not come off the vehicle. That rearward deceleration, in other words, that is if the vehicle is hit from the rear or if the vehicle is reversing and suddenly stops sideways, that has to do with turning, uh, going around a corner or a curve. Obviously, the vehicle will tilt and have some sideways force. Uh, and vertical load, that is usually impact loads. Impact loads are often absorbed by the suspension, but very often the impact load is, uh, is, a, is a, what we call a moment load. It's a very severe and sudden load. That is the reason why you will see that it is has a very high value. So in other words, you cannot just put something on the deck of the vehicle uh, and it doesn't move left or right or backwards or forwards. But if you go over a severe bump, it's going to literally launch out the back uh, and come flying at you. For example, if you are driving behind a timber truck, it is not correct that the timber truck would, being as heavy as it is, is simply loaded on the top. There has to be a securing of that, that if that timber truck hits a bump, that load is not going to jump out the top. So this is perhaps the most crucial factor. Uh, it is, if you really read between the lines of everything, it is simply saying that everything has to be secured on the vehicle, that if these kinds of forces or effect are applied on the load, the load has to stay on the vehicle and not shift around. So what does this mean to the driver or load? Uh, or, or loader or safety officer. So that is exactly what I'm explaining to you. So very often we will have a case where we are looking at and we will say to the driver, was that load secured properly? And he'll say, yes. And we'll say, to what standard? And the driver will say, he doesn't know because he should have been educated in this. We will ask him, does he know what the deceleration forces are? He will say, no, he doesn't. We will ask him, does he know when last those straps were checked? Does he know if those straps or chains meet the relevant requirements or standards? The driver will not know. Uh, and very often, not only the driver, the 
the actual fleet manager, the operations manager, uh, very often won't have a clue either. So uh, it is a it is quite a big issue. In essence, loads must not move under full braking, harsh cornering, or hard acceleration or deceleration. All right. You will note I put at the bottom here, I say get permission, be safe, and do the exercise if necessary. For those of you that are specialists like ourselves, we make a point of saying get out there and do it. So what we do is we will take vehicles, and although the specification is given, we will go and put a drum on the back, we will strap it down loosely, and we will do these tests and see what happens. We will then strap it down securely and do the test and see what happens. Our suggestion within safe, and I reiterate this, within safe, controlled, and appropriate environment is teach the drivers, teach the loading staff, teach the operational staff, um, the fleet managers, occupational health and safety, safety officers, teach them about these things and let them do, even if at a basic level, some sort of practical uh, test session to show them the pros and cons. So standards of loads in the all securing items, chains, cables, hooks, straps, tops, uh, should be used in a specific manner. Likewise, must be inspected, maintained, and in general, be up to appropriate standards. I say this in relation to general requirements, normative references. As you can see, there are standards that require that whatever is being used to secure the load on the vehicle must meet those minimum standards. You cannot simply, as a transporter, buy a strap and think to yourself that that strap is now bought, it cost me 3,000 Rand for that ratchet and strap, that's it, it's done. That strap needs to be inspected almost every time a load is done. It needs to be accounted for. Once it is aged or damaged or showing signs of fatigue and wear, it needs to be replaced. And this comes back to the standards. There needs to be some sort of register or some sort of system that uh, allows that these products that are being used are checked. All right, other points of interest or note. Way bridges. So how do you know if your vehicle is overloaded or overloaded per axle? So just remember, you may have a vehicle that can carry 20 tons and he may only have 12 tons on the vehicle. But all of that 12 tons is situated over one axle and that axle may only be allowed to carry eight tons. So the problem is not the actual overall mass, it's the fact that that full 12 tons is positioned over an eight ton axle. So how do you determine that? One of the very few ways you can determine that is with a weighbridge, where the vehicle is actually weighed for its overall mass. The weighbridge also is able to tell you how much mass is on each individual axle. The problem with this, and we appreciate this, is that not all transporters, in fact, very few, have a weighbridge. That said, you will see, I highlight there, I say, do the exercise. If you, are, if you are a transport company or you are an insurer that has a transporter that is doing regular transport on a particular route of a particular type, you can make the suggestion to that transporter, and it should be a fairly strong suggestion, that they take the vehicle and an example load of what they're normally carrying and go to a weighbridge and go and check with the driver and the operational staff that it is loaded appropriately. So weighbridges is a very important factor in terms of the loading of the vehicles and the distribution. Onboard vehicle weighing solutions, similar to the Weighbridge, you do have systems where the vehicle itself ha literally has uh, load cells, or in layman's term, it has a scale fitted to the truck at certain positions. And when the product is loaded, it'll tell you what the overall weight is. It will tell you whether there's too much weight on the front or the back. Um, these are onboard weighing solutions. They're very expensive. Very few of the transporters have these. But if it is something that is of interest to you, uh, it is something that you should look into and read up on. 
uh, evaluative or modeling software. We do have Damon online with us. Damon, I hope you're there. Maybe we can have a chat with you shortly. Um, there is software that will allow you to model what your vehicle is carrying or let's say, for instance, as we would do after an incident, we would say this particular scanner was towing an Afrit double trailer. He was towing this X product. He had that amount of this X product on. We can put it into the simulation software and it will model it for us. It will say this is how much it was overall. This is how the load was distributed. So there is that facility as well. Again, this is something that can be done as an exercise by a company. Uh, and even an insurer or a broker can ask their clients to have this done on regular loads to ensure that they are within specification. Um, obviously, it's individual to that load, but if that is the type of load that is regularly carried, uh, it is something that can be done. It, it is a function that we use not very often, uh, but it, it is a function that we have used in some of our cases. All right, other points of interest. So. They're, almost all the insurance companies themselves offer goods and transport, uh, what we call goods and transport or, or load cover. And it's just interesting to see that um, just doing a little bit of research, as you will see, I'm going to show you Bright, Iwise and Marway. They have three of their, so to say, goods and transport policies online. Reading through those policies, as you have all read and you all know, because you're all so conscientious. Well done, everybody. Um, re they say, Bright says at section 7.9, it says reasonable care. You must take reasonable care to prevent loss, destruction, damage, or death covered by this policy. What is reasonable care? So in other words, if I see uh, a major crash and somebody is killed and I get appointed and I get to that load and I see that that load is 30 tons and it's held on with two straps, that is not reasonable care. Or if I see that the vehicle is overloaded, that is not reasonable care. Awas has a goods and transport business policy, which is online. You can have a look at it. And interestingly, at 5.2, it says, we do not indemnify for loss or damage to goods and transit caused by, in particular, it says, deterioration and not being properly secured and covered. So again, uh, in terms of both the criminal liability, in terms of uh, what the act says, if you have caused someone to die uh, because you were negligent in terms of your the way you've loaded and secured, but over and beyond that, civilly, as we see here, you are going to have difficulties in your policy claim as well. Right, we nearly finished my way. Let's see what they say. And this is one of their documents online. It says, damage and transport resulting from the SPV not being tied down and secured correctly according to the manufacturer's specification. Now, it's interesting that they say that because remember, the product being transported itself that you are loading or that you are looking at as an investigator or assessor or claims handler, that product generally will have guidelines as to how it should be transported. So you are not going to go and transport uh, uh, you know, X, Y, Z in ABC manner if it's meant to be trans transported in X, Y, Z. By the same token, you cannot be using straps to secure something that is meant to be held down with chains. All right, so that is where the OEM specification comes in. You cannot use a strap where you're meant to be using a chain. The, the OEM manufacturer of the strap will say, no, our strap cannot be held liable here because the strap should not have been used. Damage and transit resulting from vehicle transporting the SPV exceeding the carrying capacity that it was designed for and is thus considered as being overloaded. So there we see my way very specifically says you cannot exceed what should be carried. And lastly, they say any goods that are not properly secured and covered whilst being transported, similar to our wires and bright as well. So very interesting that everything that you've seen here in terms of the National Road Traffic Act and leading into that, the the standards. Right, that's it from my side. Um, that's taken a good 40 minutes, a lot of talking there. 
Unfortunately, we don't have Martin on board with us, so I'm going to just open the floor and I've just put up some very quick suggestions of questions and discussions here. Um, Martin, if you are on, uh, as, um, uh, uh, Mr. Damon, if you are online, if you want to unmute yourself and have a chat with me, um, or anyone else has any questions or wants to discuss anything, let's fire away. Hi, uh, Craig, I've just unmuted myself, if that's okay. Great. Thanks for that. I, I enjoyed your slide there with uh, three options for, you know, how do you know uh, how much weight is on your vehicle? Either you take it to a weigh bridge, or you have the expensive on onboard weighing, or you you use software to model that. So yes, uh, uh, as you you must be aware, we do software that you can use to model, say the distribution of the load front rear. You can see if it's within legal limits on in terms of dimensions. So that is possible, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if if anybody has any questions about that or if you have any specific question for me. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Martin. We're fairly easy going, as you can see, as we've done. So Martin, just for those attending, is, is from Truck Science, and I say that openly. Truck Science is probably the, if not the, in the top two uh, um, leaders in the game of exactly that, modeling loads, et cetera. And so uh, Martin and his team, is amongst others, and I'm not giving any favor to anybody, but they, amongst others, are a very good resource to go to. Um, yeah, other questions coming up there, hands, Simpiwe, go for it, fire away, take yourself off mute and ask us questions. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I have a question, uh, particularly for Martin. I wanted to find out how accurate um, are the so softwares that they do develop? Because we have, um, I'm a small transporter. We usually have some problems at the way bridges and they'll say things uh, that maybe I don't quite understand the technicalities behind them, but they'll say we over we overloaded and it's because of how it's been distributed on the exiles and um, how it's been loaded, like placed on the truck. So um, not really trying to get deep into it, but how, how accurate is the software that you guys create in how the load is placed by the forklifters and um, all that sort of stuff? Okay, yes, thank you, Simpiwe. Um, that's a good question. In theory, the software is 100% accurate because it's just simple maths. But the error comes in in terms of some of the assumptions. So there are a lot of assumptions that, uh, well, it shouldn't really be an, an assumption, but it all starts off with the chassis mass from the manufacturer. So the manufacturer will give the weight for the chassis, then you have the bodybuilder, or the trailer manufacturer giving you weights, and then the then you have the payload that you're carrying. And there can always be error that creeps in, and there can be a few hundred kilograms understated on the chassis, understated on the trailer, and then when you get to the weigh bridge, you're suddenly half a ton or, or a ton over. So it's the, the inputs into the software that make it accurate. And we've we've done tests, we've done road tests with Focus Magazine, where we've uh, done the theoretical loading of the vehicles, we've then loaded the vehicles and taken them to the weigh bridge, and even then, you know, under very controlled conditions, we still get differences. You know, it's, you can get uh, five trailers from the same manufacturer, uh, and the trailers weigh slightly differently. You can get pallets of bricks, and each pallet of bricks weighs uh, slightly different. So it's the software is accurate but applying or or taking that into practice is where the error creeps in and that's why when you're designing your your vehicle or, or to carry the load you should be slightly conservative to allow for some of these miscalculations so that when you get to the weigh bridge you are within the legal limits and or within the tolerances um sorry thank you very much i also wanted to find out are there uh well obviously as a transporter you get very upset getting to the way bridge and being told you overloaded and there's thousands of rands you have to take out to fix that and 
the list goes on. But are there syndicates on the way bridges where they sit in a certain way? Because I'm starting to feel like some of the way bridges is a is a big syndicate being run there to detect uh, errors on how these trucks are loaded, uh, because obviously there's money being made from being overloaded and there's, there's charges you need to pay. So is it because I'm taking it personally or do you have you guys suspected or experienced any criminal activities at the way bridges in terms of how they sit? Or um, is it a standard setting across the whole country? Like do they detect the exact same uh, um, weights and readings, whether I'm in Limpopo, I'm in Pumalanga, I'm in Durban, um, do the, are they standardized, if I can put it that way? Yeah, so to answer that for you, sorry, David, I'm going to step in there. Yeah, the, the, yeah they're, they're, they're very, very interesting, and it's not, not only you that sits with that problem. So first of all, yes, it is standardized. Um, is it held to that standard? That's debatable in question, but it is standardized in terms of um, there, there is a limit that they will look for specifically. Um, is that machine calibrated? You are entitled as the, so to say, the transporter to ask for their calibration. So if they do not have a calibration certificate, they are not supposed to be issuing any uh, fines. So uh, again, you know, as your grandparents would say, it's not often what you say, it's how you say it. So you might want to just, you know, take a trip there yourself and go and have a chat with them and ask for their calibration certificate. That's your starting point. Your second issue is, and I know this is the worst thing ever to say to a transporter, always try and underload just a little bit uh, so that it creates safety on your vehicle and gives you that little bit of a bit of a buffer uh, in terms of if there is any error. Um, but again, this comes back to what I said earlier on. Do the exercise for yourself. Go and find a proper calibrated weigh bridge. Take the vehicle as it normally would be. Go and weigh it. Go and see what the differences, et cetera, are. And if need be, get hold of, of Truck Science and uh, Martin and get them to do the exercise for you. Thank you very much. Helps you simply, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, it's a headache. We understand that. And that's why the, the this whole issue of loading is, is yes, and the answer, there is corruption. Um, but one of the, the, the fallbacks to that, again, is go and show them that you're not Mickey Mouse. Go and show them that you are monitoring and checking. Go and show them that you want to be compliant. Generally, rule of thumb is they will then leave you alone. All right. All um, right. So I'm going to just batter through some of these questions. Yeah, I do see there is another hand up. I'll come back to that now. So the most common problems with loads that we see is two things is is overall, uh, not the overall mass. Very common. It's exactly as SMP has just said now. It's the distribution of the load. There's too much mass on a single axle or single set of wheels. And this comes back to exactly the issue that we've said about weigh bridges, modeling, checking what uh, must go where. Um, it's a very, very difficult subject matter because not everybody has a weigh bridge. Um, so just be aware of that. But uh, in general, it's something you can get around with by the people that are doing the loading and knowing what the product is, uh, knowing how to do things properly. Rule of thumb is you generally will only need to load the product once uh, and check its distribution properly, and then generally you will get it right nine times out of ten. Okay. Um, if guys, if there's anyone that has any comments on these questions as we're going through, and again, uh, apologies, Mr. Ordell is not able to join us. Handling of loads, uh, machine loading, problems, concern, overloading. So here what we're talking about is um, please also be aware of when you are using snatch blocks, overhead loading cranes, uh, forklifts in particular, um, these machines are very often well capable of picking up uh, where it says 15 tons, it can pick up 20 tons. So if you think that the person that is operating that forklift is not picking up more than 15 tons because the forklift has said it can only pick up 15 tons, he could still be overloading the vehicle because that forklift has quite a massive margin of error. So don't think um, that loading a vehicle is always in a controlled environment. Um, in fact, very often that can lead to even a bigger problem. All right, just coming back to another question there. 
Conguelo, fire away. Check yourself off mute and fire away with your question. Uh, thanks, Craig. Uh, it's more of a response to the previous uh, question. Uh, I think one of the things that the operators need to check is that way bridges check three things other than the act that uh, was being presented today they will also check your manufacturer plate of the trailer and the vehicle itself and they also check the tires so you can stop in a way bridge and they say you are okay and you are legal if they just do what we call a normal way or screening way and they are lazy to check everything and the next way bridge 50 kilometers after that if they check everything they will find that you are overloaded if you are overloaded. And also take account of the fuel or diesel that you will be using in your trucks. I agree with what Craig has said. When you load, you forget about the diesel. If you load when the vehicle is quarter full and you go and put a full tank, you have added more weight and that can actually be a problem as well when you get to weight bridges. Thanks. 100% Conguelo, that's what we like to hear. You know, the people attending are also very knowledgeable as well. So Simpiwe, uh, quite great, Conguelo is saying, you know, sometimes you'll have a 250 litre tanks, one on either side, that's 300 kilos, that could make or break whether you're overloaded. And quite correctly, so some, some way bridges are more thorough than others. So yeah, it's, 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 it's just lessons learned. I, I wouldn't take these things personally. I would really just put a little bit of effort in for one solid day and go and get the vehicle tested somewhere else, go check, go see what the limits are, go to the Weybridge, you know, make friends with them, see that they are certified, speak to them. Uh, most of these officers, uh, and I can tell you because I'm part of the Break and Tire Watch team that goes to all of these uh, Weybridges and, and we get to know them, they are very friendly and very cooperative if you come with that same type of attitude. If you come there aggressive and confrontational, <laughs> generally it ends up a headache. All right, private sector formal sacrosita or local uh, load training versus in-house. So one of the issues that has arisen in a lot of our conversations is all of these SAN specifications. These SAN specifications usually come with a list at the end of them when these SAN specifications are developed. And it will say company X, Y and Z provides this training because the SABS or SANS themselves will not necessarily provide that training. They are the facilitators and custodians to see that the standard is developed and created, but they may not offer that. The problem comes in is that a lot of the driver trainer schools or forklift schools or load uh, companies will tell you that they do training, but they may not do specific training on a particular sand spec you want or the training is not up to scratch. So what has happened as, for instance, I won't mention any specific names, but a lot of the larger transport companies get themselves accredited as, as uh, uh, so to say, Sacquecita or, or whatever the, the um, requirement is, a training provider. To, to whatever necessary need that they, they need, and they will then develop their own training standards and get uh, their staff up to spec. The point being with my question here is, we understand it's difficult to find a correct service provider for all this training. Um, you may want to pull this training in-house um, and, and develop it yourself and make sure it's up to, up to scratch. Uh, Simpiwi, I see you've raised your hand again. Fire away, no problem at all. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. Um, I just wanted to clarify something. I think I might have missed this tiny detail. So are you guys uh, suggesting that it's better to have little diesel when you load it and then fill up when you're empty? That's my first question. Then my second question is, um, whose fault is it in this whole uh, chain? Is it the driver's fault? Is it the truck spec's fault? Is it the forklifter's fault? As you're saying, some trainings are maybe not up to standard. So wh whose fault is it? If you're loaded um, in, a, in the correct way where some axles are overload or what, whatever the situation may be, whose fault is it to be overloaded? Is it us as transporters' faults? Is it the clients who maybe load their own product with their own staff 
and their own forklifts onto the trucks. So that's another question. Who's accountable for those offloading? Because we end up with the bill. You know, um, they'll tell you you need to call a forklift at the at the at the way bridge and they can charge you four thousand rand, however much it will be, to fix that. So what I'm trying to 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 establish is who who must take accountability for these errors. Um, yeah, very, very difficult questions you've posed. So the first one regarding your fuel, um, there is no right or wrong answer to that. So uh, if you know your vehicle is going to be leaving, let's say Johannesburg and going to Durban, it would be very rare that that vehicle would not leave with a full tank. So my suggestion would be is that you take the worst case scenario and that when you are loading, account for the, the fact that the vehicle would have full tanks uh, because that is going to put the vehicle at its maximum mass in terms of the vehicle itself. Uh, and then obviously, if, for instance, you're carrying 300 kilos of fuel when you start, you're going to have to account for 300 kilos less of actual load. So, there, But again, there is no right or wrong for that. If your vehicles only ever travel with half tank um, for whatever, perhaps security reasons, well, then that's what you would use as half tank. In terms of appointing fault, very, very difficult question. The short and abrupt answer to it is that the driver is responsible. In the National Road Traffic Act, anything that happens with the vehicle in terms of its massive load, in terms of whether it has a crash, in terms of anything, it is essentially the driver that is at fault. It is the driver's duty as a professional driver to have that minimum standard requirement training. And this comes back to this issue of why we say the driver training in South Africa is not up to scratch. Because if you go, for instance, and we don't always like to do this, but if you go to certain other countries, you would see that their advanced driver, their commercial driver training is not simply knowing how to drive a vehicle. It actually covers the issues of loading, offloading, uh, understanding the technical parameters of the vehicle. But again, to come back to your answer, um, if if your vehicle is loaded at a client and it's loaded incorrectly, you could forgive the driver if he would reasonably think that it looks like it's loaded correctly and it's only just over. Let's say it's get found to be 250 kilos over, which in the greater scheme of things of a commercial vehicle is not a lot. But the problem then is going to be is that they are going to come to you because you are the transporter. Remember, Regulation 49, the issue of consign or consignee. When that product is in your uh hands, so to say, you are responsible for everything around that. You can try and knock on that bill back to the party that loaded it because they loaded it incorrectly, but I would think you would have, have you would have a lot of difficulty with that. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Thank you. Tubi, if I'm saying that correct, Olatubi, fire away. Hello, Toby, take yourself off mute and fire away with your question. Your hand is up. Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, Kamataka, I think it is. Fire away with your question. Take yourself off mute. Hello, Craig. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fire away. My name is Linetela Haipinge. Karnataka is actually the company that I'm working for. I'm calling in from Namibia. I would like to make a correction on the answer that we have given for just the lady that have asked in terms of uh, whether she have to load the vehicle with an empty tank or she have to make it a full tank so that she can avoid overloading. Uh, here I would like to bring to attention that the, the, an empty vehicle, if you look at the configuration of your vehicle, there is a gross mass volume of your vehicle when it's empty, including a full tank. And uh, there is uh, the maximum volume that it can carry in addition to what you are going to add to the natural volume of your and mass of your vehicle. So consider that your vehicle is already 1,500 and the maximum it can carry is 2,500. It means that with your car with a full tank, it's already 1,500 and you can only add an additional 1,000 uh, uh, kg or tons or whatever, I don't know. Uh, just to bring to attention that, that that's how the calculation is done. So you must take a look at the 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 the, 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 the ground uh, volume of your vehicle with a full tank. It's already written on your vehicle, 
then you can uh, check how much maximum can be added uh, to your vehicle, then you can avoid the uh, overloading. So there is no problem of whether you should drive with an empty tank or you should drive with a full tank because the full tank is already considered in your gross vehicle volume and mass. Thank you, Craig. I hope I am not, I'm, I'm, I'm not correct or wrong, but that's my view. So thank you. Well, yeah, thank you for that. And Piwik, to coming back to that, I don't, I don't want to go into this any further than, than has already been said. Uh, but in essence, in real layman's terms, is uh, there is a percentage of area that is allowed for. Uh, that's regardless of your fuel or what you're carrying. There's a percentage of area that is allowed for at the Weybridge. Uh, and if you exceed that, that is when they are going to fine you. Uh, I can assure you that if you are allowed uh, 10 tons and you are 10.05 tons, uh, the chances on them finding you is very, very minimal. Unless they are really being antagonistic, uh, they would allow for a percentage. Once you are over that percentage, they would then fine you. Um, but again, uh, let's not hammer down into finer details. Yeah, you may want to get a hold of someone like myself or Truck Science or uh, any of the other experts available, uh, and then you can really hammer down into that um, finer. Uh, Mahendra, fire away. You've got your hand up there. Take yourself off mute. Please ask. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Um, my question is around the abnormal permit. Um, if you're running your operations here in KZN and you apply for an abnormal permit, you get uh, all the necessities are done, but your vehicle crosses province and you're in another province, but it is not accepted when the authorities uh, do stop you. We've had cases like that and they don't want to accept that uh, permit and the vehicle is still prosecuted for um, projection um, because it falls out, it, it is in the abnormal category as such. Um, I'm not sure if this is a norm or what is the rule when abnormal permits are applied for, especially when it uh, enters across a uh, provincial, another province. Big things. All right. I'll stand under correction with this uh, because it's been a while since I've actually had to deal with this subject matter. So if there's anyone else that is online that deals with this daily that wants to chip into it, that's fine. But I can almost assure you that uh, the abnormal load permit is um, for your region. In other words, your province. Uh, if you are going across province, you need to go through the same process with that province as well. Uh, hence, that is the reason for your problem. Uh, and that is very often the reason, reason why you will see, for instance, RTR KZN will escort you to their boundary. And then if, it's, if it is really required that you have that kind of escort, then you will see that the next province will pick up from there. Uh, so you need to, I would be, I would caution to just check uh, into province or into region that there are specifications that will apply. They will all be very, very similar, but there are very, there are also very definitive uh, rules and regulations for the different areas. Hope that answers your question. If there's anyone else that wants to chip into that as we're going along, please do. Uh, Olatubi, back to you again. I see you have your hand up. Okay, your microphone. I can see you've taken yourself off mark, but you there's nothing coming through. So if you want to just type your question in the in the chat box and we will come back to you. Guys, uh, we've gone over time already. So those of you that want to leave, thank you very much for that. I'm going to just carry on with these couple of these questions and just discuss on that uh, and then just get a final comment from Truck Science. Um, but very quickly, as you will receive the presentation as normal, we have listed for you an extensive list of reference material. Um, so it is all in the presentation and it'll come through to you from the lovely Eloise in the office as she always sends it through to you. Um, and we have not only given you the ones we've gone through, we've given you an extensive list of all other references. As you can see, it goes down to about 89 different relevant references, everything to do with loads, loads on vehicles. Um, we have also given you some links to some training. There, uh, you can go and have a look at any of those. Um, our next session will come to you and be advised. Uh, we will, as always, send it through to you. Any other questions in the meantime? All right, uh, Damon, from your side, uh, from Truck Science, any other input? Um, yeah, thanks, side? Craig. Just uh, very briefly, so if you are interested in using software to model your load distribution, 
you're welcome to visit our website at truckscience.com. You can register oh, for a free so trial so version of the software there, and uh, oh, we'll be able to support you with any questions from there as well. Yeah, lovely. Thank you for that, Damon. I appreciate the fact that you came on board for the session. Uh, um, Simpiwe, I hope you heard that. Um, but if you didn't hear that, you'll get it on the recording or you can contact myself or just look for Truck Science online. I did. Thank um, you very much. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah, just uh, one or two other comments for those that have stayed on. Uh, record keeping, very, very important that record keeping is, is held for uh, what what is transported, what loads are carried uh, from and to um, what the product is. So record keeping is very important in terms of if an incident occurred, uh, for example, for us, it's the very first thing we're going to ask for. What, what is your consignment? What is your load sheet? What, where, where did you fetch it? What way bridge, et cetera? Um, uh, just very quickly, passengers on, on in load bins or on platforms on decks is not allowed. Regulation 247 in the National Road Traffic Act deals with, uh, sometimes we'll see literally commercial vehicles driving down the road with cars on the back with people sitting in the car. Uh, that's not allowed. Um, there are no actual stats or data on the number of crashes that involve or are directly attributed to overloading or load shift or or protrusions, etc. Uh, unfortunately, that kind of data is not collated here in South Africa. Um, so it's it's something that we can't really look at empirically from research. Yeah, that's it from our side, guys. I, I hope that gave you some insight. Thank you all for attending as usual. Um, please be safe. If you have any questions in the discussion section or want to talk to me, I'll stay online for a couple of minutes. Thank you.